day we all start spiraling and we're not real yeah. people. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Merry Christmas, guys. <laughs> all right. Tell me when we're speeding. Okay, guys, we are rolling into another episode of the Candace Owen Show, and this is going to be a real fun one. Ladies and gentlemen, this might shock you all, but I do not support the body positivity movement, and I can hear the leftists shrieking already. Here to discuss why I don't support it, why she once did, and why she no longer does, I have Gina Florio. Uh, Gina Florio, I would say your name a bit better mm-hmm. there, trainer and wellness coach and a freelance writer. Gina, welcome to the Candace Owen Show. Thank you for having me, Candace. I've been wanting to meet you for such a long time. Well, thanks. I hope I hope I live up to your expectations, if the expectations are high and not low, that is. <laughs> I hope so, too. So we were having a little bit of a conversation in the green room and talking about a bunch of things, but I'm going to start this with an anecdote. Um, so I went online, and there's this girl I follow who does uh, a lot of fashion stuff. She's a great sense of style. She's amazing. Um, and she posted this picture of her. She's got two kids, and she was in a bikini. She's very, she's very thin. Um, and she said, I finally got back down to my like pre body weight and she's a skinny girl. Mm -hmm. Instantly she got hit by the body positivity movement by telling her that she was too skinny. The body positivity police. Yeah. The body positivity Mm -hmm. police decided her body was not positive because she was too skinny. And the funny thing, this is like the funny, ironic thing is one of the people that attacked her was Amanda Seyfried. I think that's how you say her last yes. name. She was a literal mean girl from Mean Girls. <laughs> she was an oh, actual no. mean girl. Yeah, oh, she's the no. actress. And she, and, and she basically just like screen capped it and wrote something on her story saying, applauding her girlfriends for all attacking and bullying this skinny girl and saying that people should be more responsible and shouldn't be putting out that as a desirable body to have. So since Amanda wow. Seyfried attacked, you know, she tagged her brave she friend. She must not have a lot of work right now. To, I know. She's, to be not, doing she's got that. no work right now. <laughs> she tagged her brave friend who heroically attacked the skinny girl. Right. So I go to her brave friend's page. And what do I see? This is a woman who is posting pictures of her cellulite and her stretch marks and her belly. Belly yep. and hashtag body positive. Hashtag love yourself. Yeah. Hashtag health at every size. That's my new favorite one. And then all the comments are like, yes. Yes, queen. Yes, yes. queen. Yeah. It's a really funny thing, isn't it? Because, you know, you talk so much about virtue signaling. It's virtue signaling in the oddest way. They they love to take pictures of their belly rolls, of their big <laughs> thighs, of the arms. I think, you know, like called biscuit dough or whatever it is and they biscuit. just love <laughs> is it <laughs> called biscuit dough <laughs> I don't know so they love to put it out there and I think to them it's encouraging women to love their body right but I think at best it's it's allowing women to make choices that you know of course are not great for their body but I think at worst this is the cynic in me I think body positivity is a tool used by the radical left and by modern feminists to control and manipulate women absolutely because if you think about I mean think about if if you were 50 60 80 pounds overweight right and so first of all, people say, well, you can't say that, Candace. You've never been fat. You've never been obese, right? First of all, anyone can have an opinion about anything regardless of where you come from, what your experiences are, what you all, look like, what you look like, whatever. We're all allowed to have opinions. Second of all, I myself have been very overweight, 50, 60 pounds. Interesting. Could not get out of bed in the morning. I would stay in bed until noon. I would eat the most ratchet food you could ever possibly think of. And so when you're overweight and when you have all this extra baggage on you, not only is it you're literally carrying around more of you, but your brain doesn't function as well. When you're eating junk food and when you're not exercising and moving the body, of course, you're not able to think straight. You're not really able to be a free thinker, which is something you talk about so much. So I really think that body positivity is used as a way to keep these women down. Absolutely. Because when they're not able to function at their best, at their highest capacity, of course, they're not going to be able to see what's really happening in the world. Of course, they're not going to be able to make more conscious decisions. And so it's a really disappointing thing. So on one end, it's very funny and it's hilarious because Amanda Seyfried, I mean, what else, what better does she have to do than to go on some woman's profile and troll her essentially for not being fat? But then at the same time, it's a very sinister thing that 
honestly sometimes keeps me up at night. I, right. I really worry about and, it. And here's the thing. When you start saying things like fa- you're fat phobic, right? I mean, first off, I don't have a fear of fat people. And I'm, I'm like, oh my God, there's a fat person. I have to run. So I don't even, <laughs> I don't even know what that term means. Okay. But I actually think people need to realize the number one killer in America is heart disease, right? So now we're having people promote and make it seem like th- there should be a token of appreciation given to women who are brave enough to yes. show their cellulite and their stretch marks. And by the way, I actually think it, healthy body positivity is acknowledging that we don't have perfect bodies, right? But you don't need a 400-pound woman and, and and try to steamroll that into, you know, a mother that has four kids and has stretch marks. It's exactly. two entirely different things. Yes. You should feel confident if, if you, uh, you know, brought the miracle of life into the world and... And, and, and you have stretch marks, you should not feel ashamed of that. Not and at and all. I, I promote that, but that is not what the body positivity movement has become. It has become a, a witch hunt on women that are thin. You're not allowed to like yourself if you're thin. And, and God forbid you, you wear a bikini and say you're proud of your body mm-hmm. when you're thin, then you get routinely attacked. And at the same time, it's sending a signal to other women that they shouldn't want to better themselves. You should want to better yourself. Always, Always want to better yourselves. And, yes. and it, being thin does not mean that you don't have moments where you don't feel your best and that's just the truth I mean I I, when I once I started traveling at the pace that I travel now it was really hard for me to get into a workout routine and I felt so gross about myself not because I was probably low energy too low energy I was eating crappy airport food and I I should want to change that yeah yeah and going back to what you said I think it's really important to say this fact obesity is the number one killer of Americans today And I feel like I have to say that five times Mm -hmm. for it to sink in. Obesity is the number one threat to American lives today. If you turn on the news, what are they trying to convince us? They're trying to convince us that racism, police brutality, police brutality, transphobia, homophobia, Islamophobia, all of these things are going to end Americans' lives, right? Like these are the biggest threats to Americans' lives. I think it's so, it's so disappointing that we can't even say the fact that, hey, We are the most developed nation. We are the most incredible nation in the world. And yet at the same time, we have the highest rates of obesity. How on earth is that even possible? And it's not even just now. If you look at the history, 1949, the National Institutes of Health, they they issued a statement saying that obesity in the 40s was an issue. 1950s, 1960s, and the 1970s, I think it was, the NIH said that obesity was the most prevalent metabolic disorder of the age. Yeah. That was in the 70s. And now it's 2019. And then not only are we not addressing publicly what's really happening with obesity, but we've taken it a step further. We're praising, we're glorifying women for being obese and not for their accomplishments. It's not like a woman happens to be overweight and she's accomplished something incredible because that's a different story. Mm -hmm. But we're praising and glorifying women simply for being obese, right? simply for showing their obesity and showing their big bodies. Mm -hmm. There's something really, really wrong with that. And there's something really sad to that too. And it it really, it always brings me back to, I think, kind of the crux, the foundation of the radical left's platform. It's, It's amoralization, right? There's no right and there's no wrong. So moral relativism, what might be right for one person might not be right for another. So you can see this in many different ways, right? So abortion is a great example. So abortion might not be right for one person, but if another woman chooses to do it, then it's okay. Well, OBC might not be right for one person, but it's okay for you. And it's okay maybe for us in our ivory towers writing all these things on mainstream media outlets and distributing fake news. We're going to get married and have kids, get married before we have kids. But if you don't want to get married before you have kids, that's totally Totally fine, you know. So there's this discrepancy that's happening, and it's so disappointing to see because the impacts are huge. And you have these women who are walking around who are unhealthy, and here's unhappy, unhappy. But here's the kicker, Candice. You know, you talk. You're such a champion for Black communities. Obesity disproportionately affects Black communities and Hispanic communities. Absolutely, it's forty eight percent. It's the crap you're eating. I mean, when you know, I didn't come from a wealthy family, and you know, want to know what we ate every night when I was a kid? We ate those frozen hungry man you know, dinners, the TV dinners that yeah. you get. That was every night dinner. That was literally how we super ate every cheap. single night. Super cheap, right. really horrible things that are in it. My dad has struggled with obesity his entire life. He goes up, 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 down, up, down. When my dad would lose weight, when he'd lose 100 pounds, he felt great. He was a happier person. Yes. Right? And 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 that's the, the whole idea is that they're not, they're selling to them like they should just be content where they are when in fact they could be so much more content if they actually got in the driver's seats of their own life yeah. and made some changes. Personal responsibility. Personal responsibility is a dirty word. Careful. No one wants to hear it. You'll get called a bigot. You'll yep. get called a racist, a sexist, or a sizeist. That's a new word. Sizeist. Sizeism. 
they're just I don't coming know. up with words. I, I, oh. I promise you, they're they're literally plucking things out of thin air. What is a sizist? When when did that get started? <laughs> I have no idea. But I mean, I've been accused of being a sizist before. I see a lot of people online being accused of being a sizist. But it's just we're afraid to say this universal truth. There is a right way. And there is a wrong way to treat the human body. Hmm. There's a right and a wrong way. And that's a big part of the radical left, right? They don't want to say something is right or wrong. They don't want to lay down these boundaries. They want to say what's wrong is right. What's wrong is right. They want to flip it. Flip it, yeah. Not only do they not want to say what's right, they want to absolutely flip it. Mm -hmm. And that's so scary. But there is a right and a wrong way to treat your body. And the wrong ways to treat your body, I mean – and, and I have to say this so much to students, especially in college, to young adults, because this is the time of life where it's most common to make these choices where we do a lot of reckless drugs, have sex with a lot of people, we binge eat, we binge drink, binge drink. These are all objectively bad things to do to your body. There's a right and a wrong way to treat the body, especially coming from a Christian perspective. Mm. I mean, there's there's so much scripture in the Bible, especially in 1 Corinthians, it talks about how our bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit. Our bodies are a gift and everything that we eat and drink and everything we do with our bodies should be a way to honor God. Right. Right. And so the farther and farther that we move away in our society from religion and from the recognition of God and God's presence and his love for us, the more we're going to end up treating our bodies worse and worse and worse because we don't recognize that there is a right and a wrong. Right. You you are similar to me in that you kind of had a big shift happen for you as well. You were on the left. You told me that you used to write um, – all of these things about body positivity, which you now disagree with as a movement. Of course, yes. we, we both would like people to be positive about their bodies if their bodies are within the span of normalcy mm -hmm. um, and healthy, but that is not what body positivity is. You used to write about intersectional feminism, and you used to write awful things about our current president, Donald Trump. Is that correct? I did all of those things plus some. <laughs> Guilty. <laughs> and you know what? Part of me feels very embarrassed that there is a paper trail of me online. If you can look at any of the publications I wrote for in the past, it's no secret. Just type in my name online. I did a Google search the other day, nearly fell out of my seat of what came up. But in, in one sense, it's embarrassing, but in another way, I am so proud of how far I've come. And I really, truly believe that I'm a testament that you can believe anything. You can be so far in the depths of the radical left's platform, so far into modern feminism, and yet you can still turn around right. and see the truth and see the light. I love that. I think that's what people need to see more of. I say we need to be more accepting and, and allow people to actually change, and they should know that any moment that you want to wake up and you want to enter society and you want to be a productive yeah. member and you don't want to be someone that wakes up every day feeling angry and bitter, you're, oh, yeah. you're allowed to change your mind. That's a part of being a human being growing and, and having a fresh perspective and outlook on things. Things. Yeah. I mean, I was the angriest of the angry. I was always shouting from the rooftops about my oppression. You know, a lot of my family came to this country as immigrants, and I used to call myself a woman of color, a biracial. You know, I used to I used to take on all of those labels. All of the labels. Mm. I used to and I and there's this article that performed very well for this publication I used to write for about how President Trump is causing mental illness across the country and making people depressed and anxious and ruining lives. And I go back and I read this and I'm thinking to myself, I'm like, how was I even there? But I mean, it's it's not – it's there's nothing we have to guess. I was indoctrinated and brainwashed by higher education. I mean, I went to Harvard for my graduate school, which is the probably the worst of the worst. Right. You know, and I took classes – I took a class called Race, Ethics, and the U.S. Prison System. Oh, perfect. My first year. Mm -hmm. And perfect. it was – Just what – I mean, they name it so that you already know what sorts of indoctrination is going to happen. And they name it in a way that's so attractive when you come in and you're very naive and you're kind of green and you you're like, this looks great because social, I'm going to be so woke. I'm, I'm going to be, be awake. so woke. I'm such a good person. This social, social justice, justice feels good. It does. It feels good to be, to, to be righteous and angry about something because I think the – the non-cynic in me, the optimist in me wants to believe that all these people who are screaming about oppressions and about all of the, the ways that our society is oppressed, I think at the very end of the day, they want people to live good and happy lives. Right. You know, and they want people to be well. They want people to prosper. I, do you think so? Do you really think so? Or, I, or do you think – I'm going to pause there. I actually, I want <laughs> to think about I really want to think about that. I don't know what I think, but I want to explore that thought because I question whether or not at the end of the day they're actually good people 
or if at the end of the day, they're actually just little narcissists. And mm. there's a, there's an element of virtue signaling mm. that is incredibly narcissistic, where it's you say you want to help people, but the second a different you you are exposed to different evidence or mm. or that that goes against your conclusion that you've accepted, you get really angry. And I'm a living, breathing example of that. They cannot accept that a black conservative exists. They can't accept it. it so they'd rather accuse me of being a self hating black. A white supremacist. Right, right. And if, if at the end of the day you were just a good person who wanted black Americans to live the way that, they, that, that feels good to them, why can't you accept that there might be a few of us that don't view ourselves as victims? Why does Alyssa Milano block me on Twitter, right, when I attack her, her narrative that the, the MAGA hat is the new KKK hood? And oh. I say, you know what? That's actually really She's disrespectful nice. to my ancestors that are still breathing, that had to live with the real KKK. So her yeah. solution is to block me. Yeah. Is she a good person on the inside? Yeah, that is that. That is definitely a question that's worth asking. I think for the most part in my experience, the people that I worked with, you know, people who were also writers, who were also editors in the mainstream media. I mean, I'm talking about people, people who produced and distributed fake news. I mean, I was in the heart of it for years. Mm -hmm. I think for the most part, the people that I met, they really do want to do some kind of good in the world. I think they've just been so brainwashed and so misguided. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know. I think Hollywood is a different – beast itself. I think there is a lot of narcissism there that that is both hilarious and disgusting to watch, mm. you know? And so I think it's a little bit of a different scene there. But part of me really wants to believe that all of these young women, especially who I used to work with um, and who I used to work for, like we, we wanted to create content that would help women live better lives, that would help women take care of themselves better, that would help women make the right choices in their lives. But we were just so misguided. Mm. And I think people just don't understand how much the news – I'm not talking about part of the news. The news platform, the news, is fake. Right. And I can't – I still cannot convince people – that I live with in San Francisco, that I know in San Francisco, that the things they read and the things they're outraged about, it is so absolutely false it's and scary. fake. It's scary. It's scary. I it's mean, scary. When, when you take a bird's eye view of it, where we, and I always say this, like when you're in school, you learn about propaganda, right? You actually learn about propaganda. You talk about yellow journalism. You talk about, you know, certain times in America. You talk about certain times in Europe, right, where propaganda was rich. And you you are looking ex from the from the external and saying, wow, that could never happen to us. Like mm -hmm. I'm I'm educated, but but really, actually, education is the way that people are becoming indoctrinated. And we way. are all victims of pro propaganda. Mm -hmm. And what's sad is the people that can't break the spell, because it is a spell. It's a spell and it's a curse. Yes. Um, and, and it actually, at this level, it, it stops you from living your best life and for pursuing your, your goals because there's mm -hmm. so much woke culture. People telling you every day what you have to be mad at, what you have to go out into the middle of the streets and demand social justice about. And you're not living in a reality. Mm -hmm. and, and that, to me, is really really, really sad to consider. And you know what's kind of ironic is that, so I grew up in a really small town in South Georgia. It's a small town called Richmond Hill. There was only one stoplight in my town. Church was on every corner. I mean, this is the deep South I'm talking about. Mm. Kind of, I think, probably 20 to 30 miles south of Savannah, Georgia. And that's where I grew up. I moved there. My, I think I was five when my parents and I moved there. And I grew up And where in, were your parents from? You said they were immigrants. So my dad is Italian, born and raised in America, but my mom is from South Korea. Okay. So they met in Korea and they got married. They fell in love, came here together and started a family here. Um, and so, you know, I think just having that perspective as well makes me so grateful. I think every day we should wake up and be so, so grateful to be in America. And I see so many people whining and complaining about it. And it just, it drives me mad. But going back to what I was saying, I grew up in South Georgia, a very small town. And when people hear that I'm from a town that small, or when I tell them about a town like that, they say terrible things like, I'm so sorry you had to grow up there. Oh, that you must, you must have grown up with so many rednecks and idiots. And the way that we think about these small rural towns, the way that we think about the working class. Another example, I, I go to a jujitsu gym in San Francisco, and most of the people I train with there, most of them are working class. I don't know many people who are in tech. I don't know many people who went to an Ivy League school. Most of them work with their hands, hard labor. They have kids. They're married. They're the salt of the earth. And yet these are the people that us in our ivory towers, they look down on, they're the deplorables. Mm -hmm. But the more and more I experience especially San Francisco, but just life in general, the more I experience, the more I go back and I'm like, no, they're getting something right there. 
they're getting something right. These people are so devoted to their families. They're so devoted to their country. They're so devoted to God. They have incredible children. And like, yeah, sure, they're not going to grow up and be, you know, physicists that are changing the world, but they're doing work that is so worthy and so needed and they are the most neglected. And it it really, it's sad to me mm-hmm. that we are now so arrogant and people sit in their ivory towers and they look down and say, oh, those are the dumb people. They're idiots. And I'm like, they are, they're smarter than you in a way. They're so, they have their life figured out. And you're up there screaming and writing content about how Trump is ruining the world. And yet look at your personal life. You're so unhappy. It's in shambles and they're unhappy. It's in shambles. And the problem is that when you talk about, you know, California or New York is that they actually haven't visited true America. They have a concept or, or a perception in their mind rather of what they think true America is. And the more and more that I travel for work, I've almost done all 50 states now. I think I have three left. Every time I touched on a new state, I realized how ignorant I was the day before yep. because I'm, I am I get to see real America. I get to see the way that people actually work. And I understand um, that what the real political arguments are and how it impacts real people that don't live in giant cities, yep. uh, cities that have no trees like New York. Um, and it's funny because those are people that think that they should be allowed to inform policy, people that have no experience and never worked a day in their life with their hands, um, people that have never been in nature trying and dictate how we how we should communicate with wildlife you know yep. they're out there lobbying saying whether or not people should have guns they've never hel- held one they've never yep. needed one they've never had bear and moose in their backyard and it makes you realize um we we are we are cursed with ignorance when you grow up on the coast you, yeah. you really are in a major city um and it you is can a be spell. cursed with ignorance you know it, it's i think you nailed it on the head it is a spell because i felt and I'll tell you, when I watched your interview on the Rubin Report with Dave Rubin, that was a big moment for me. I swear I felt like I'd been baptized. I was like, oh, my <laughs> gosh. I was like, oh, my gosh. And I started running through everything that I had once believed. And I started running through all the things. That's when my journey started. The shifting really with me, started. You just went right along with wait, me. Wait, yeah. went right along with I was you. like, something's not adding up here. <laughs> I was like, jumped on the candy <laughs> shirt. I was like, I'm like, who is this girl? What is she saying? Is something going to change my life here? I, something shifted in me. And I started to go back to all the things I learned in school. Even back to high school, there was, there was always that one wacky teacher in high school that is – is very liberal. I don't even want to say liberal, though, because liberal is different than leftist, like very leftist, you know? Mm -hmm. And then even starting from there, I would go back and run through all the experiences in my life in the classroom and what I was taught and then how it compares to the real world, real life experience. And it's just, I don't know what's going to happen to higher education when I think about it now. I, I won't send my kids to school in this environment unless they, unless they want to do something that requires, I mean, if you want to be a doctor, of course, you, you have to, uh, you have to go to university. But from what I've seen on campus, these are just little indoctrination camps. And you're, you, <laughs> the best part of these indoctrination camps is you get to pay $100,000 to have your child indoctrinated. Good to be in that debt doesn't for seem like years. a very good deal to me. Uh, so no thanks. I made the mistake. I went to school. I didn't need to do it. Um, I didn't know what I wanted to do, but I felt the pressure. Society was go, go, go. Yeah. Really, they just want a few more years for them to indoctrinate your kid and brainwash them and pollute them with things that are not practical s- skills that are going to help them in the real world. Yeah. Half of these majors are completely crazy. I mean, I was in, did you see my, I recently testified in Congress. Yes, I saw Next that. to a doctor. Yeah. Okay. She had like two PhDs. And, and in in white, na- like, it was literally like in white, na- I'm like, what is that? What are you even a doctor in? And the, no numbers. She had no numbers, no stats. It's she comical. had a feeling that white supremacy was on the rise. Yeah. And she's a doctor. Yeah. She went to Yale. Yeah. And it's funny. I love to watch. I went to um, one of the campus events you did with Charlie Kirk and Dave Rubin. I think it less than two years ago at UC Berkeley. Yeah, yeah. I, I went out there. I was like, I got to see what's happening. Because I, I love to watch all the videos that Turning Point releases, all the videos that Charlie releases. Because I want to see what's happening on campus. I want to see what has changed since I was on campus. I want to see what the future looks like. And what's so funny to me is that the higher up, the higher school, you know, in the ranking that you guys go to, the dumber the questions they ask. No, I, I, I promise you. It's they ask the most ridiculous yeah. questions. When, when, when you guys were at UC Berkeley, the questions they were asking, I was like, I'm looking around. I'm like, D- are you guys students here? <laughs> and I watch – and you know what's funny? I watch videos of somewhere like Florida State University, these state universities that are not on the map, and these kids are asking – very useful, very in-depth questions that we need to ask. Mm. And yet at the Ivy League school level, these kids are – I don't even know what they're talking about. Honestly, Harvard or where you went, I really do just – sometimes I see the stories coming out of there and I just think to myself, I think this is supposed to be the 
tippity top of the pie. Best of the best. Best of the best. You can't get any better. Oh my God, the cream of the crop. And I'm like, you guys are all morons. 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 Absolutely morons. I think the blessing that happened to me was I was poor and my student loan got declined my senior year and I had to drop out. So they didn't get that extra year to indoctrinate me. Yep. So then I had to to develop real schools. I had real skills because I had $100,000 student loan debt. I had to figure out how to get out of it. And guess what? It wasn't liberalism or feminist protests that got me out of it. It was it was conservative principles, working hard, saying to myself, why the heck did I even sign these ridiculous loans? Look how much I have to pay because I had no practical skills. I just had emotions and fear of not going to school. And you know what that that got me into? $100,000 in debt with no degree to speak of. And even if I had gotten the degree in journalism, who knows what I would have done that would have helped me pay down that astronomical fees that I paid for that for that degree. I mean, look at what I do now. I I got two bachelor's degrees, one in music, piano performance. I was a pianist for most of my life. And then I also got a bachelor's degree in religious arts, right? So, okay, great. I'm not going to, I don't know what I'm going to do with that. So after college, I was like, I don't know what to do. I kept being pressured to go to graduate school. So I got a master of theological studies. Guess how much I use that degree? Zero. I, I, what, what can I do with that degree now? Right. Most of the people who were in that program with me, they went on to get their PhD and they're just staying in the school doing research. Then they'll maybe become teaching. the professors. Then they'll become the professors. And then they'll just, you know, cycle the same stuff over and over again. And I left school. You know what I did as soon as I graduated from graduate school? I went to yoga teacher training. I was like, I don't know what to do. Right. I don't know what to do. Could've, I was could have done that without <laughs> could have done that. Could have done that without even a high school degree. You know what I mean? So it's and 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 now what I do, I'm a trainer, I'm a wellness coach. I don't use that degree much. I mean, there's some I don't want to say skills, but there are some things that I learned. I did a lot of counseling classes. And so I use a bit of that with my clients now, especially clients who come to me and want to make really big changes in their life, whether it's like lose 50 pounds or shift their personal life around. Of course, I use some of the things I learned from school there. But 99% of what I do now, I did not have to go to college or graduate school at all. All you had to do is figure out what you actually liked and and have the courage to go after your dreams, entrepreneurship. Yeah. And and they don't teach that anymore. It's it's, it's like with a gun to your head when you're in high school, you got to go to college. You got to go to college and people don't pause and say, wait a second, do I need to go to college? What do I actually want to do? What am I actually good at? How can Mm -hmm. I contribute in society? It's not all about just taking useless courses all the time. Yeah. And I actually want you to talk a little bit about because you said you were 60 pounds heavier. Yeah. So how did you get to that point and how did you go the other direction? I really like telling the story because I think it can be useful for many young women. So I have always been pretty athletic. I've always been into fitness. I played tennis as a teenager. I was really into CrossFit for a while. I was teaching yoga full time. And I was always this, you know, pretty fit person who loved to eat well and exercise. Um, But, you know, everyone hits rock bottom at some point in their life. And and I hit that point in 2016. There was two things back to back that happened. I was living in Australia and I was kind of, like I told you in the green room, I was living that lost, wandering millennial life where I didn't want to commit to anything and I didn't want to, to be a part of the evil American capitalist society. So I was traveling to South America and Thailand and doing all that stuff. And I actually had a near-death experience in Australia. I went to turn on the barbecue, the gas tank underneath my barbecue, and it wasn't hooked up correctly, and there was an open flame, and it exploded and ignited a fire on my body. And I passed out, and I was rushed to the hospital, and I had first and second degree burns all over face, neck, arms. It was it was quite a traumatic experience. Oh, my goodness. And I hear people, you know, they joke about the term PTSD, but I lived with real PTSD for a while. Any click of a burner, I would, you know, I, my body would react to it. And then a couple of weeks after that, I had to leave Australia because I was on a tourist visa and I had to renew my tourist visa. And I was illegally teaching yoga at the time. So I was an editor and a freelance writer for publications in the U.S. So that was my main source of income. But as a on a tourist visa, I was also teaching yoga on the side, which is illegal. And so when I was coming back into the country to renew my tourist visa, long story short, they saw that they somehow discovered that I was teaching. They put me in a detention prison, locked me up, and deported me. That's a whole other story in and of itself. Wow. But when I came back to America, I really came back with my tail in between my legs Mm -hmm. because I started to question every choice that I had made. What was I doing over there? Why did I spend four years just traveling overseas, doing all the things that millennials love to do, doing a lot of drugs, plant medicine, being in polyamorous relationships? I was so far from God. I grew up Christian and I was an atheist and I had left behind all of that. I left behind my faith. I even left behind my family for four years. And so I was very, very humbled in a way that was devastating. 
and I had to go back to my parents' house. Where else could I go? I don't have anywhere left to go in the US. So I was back in South Georgia, 26, 27 years old. And every day I would just wake up and eat. And I was I was very depressed and I was so upset and I would just eat and eat and eat and eat and eat and I gained 60 pounds. And so then I was in truly the rock bottom of my life. Mm. And there are no words to describe the devastation because I had planned a life in Australia. I was actually dating an Australian guy. We were talking about getting married. It didn't work out. We were going to get married anyway, all of that. And so I felt like my life had really fallen apart. Mm. And in that moment was when I was like, this is not working for me. This this commitment to modern feminism and body positivity, these values, they're not working for me. Why is it that every publication I write for, the highest performing content is weight loss and how to live a healthy life, yet at the same time, you're forcing me to write all this stuff about body positivity and obese women. And I woke up and I was like, okay, I have to get my life together. I found a way to lose all the weight. I changed my diet. I turned everything around. And that's when I moved to San Francisco and started a, a new career there. But that was, you know, it was really, I say it again, it was the rock bottom of my life. And being that overweight, especially having been having been someone who was very fit and very vibrant and healthy, mm. it was it was a big wake up call for me. Right. And I you know what I love that you said that, that you sort of got you just kind of got back on the wagon, right? You you sort of got back in the driver's seat of your life. And that's so important, I think, especially for fat people in general to know that if you are a fat person and you want to change your life, great. Right. That means you can do something about that. And I think that if we really want to talk about body positivity, it would be that form of encouragement. Yeah. It would be sharing stories of, hey, I was there too. Yeah. And there is a way forward and you can feel better. And I used to feel like you. Yeah. It's not the other way by saying to them, good, that's really good. Sit there. That's great. Mm -hmm. That's horrible. Yeah. Why would you want someone to live in existence that doesn't make them feel good every single day? Yeah, you're doing them Why are you trying to convince them that they're happy? And, and then the other element of that that gets added on to it is you also see that men who are not attractive to clinically obese women oh my goodness. are considered like they're bigots and, and fat phobic and all this stuff. And I'm like, that's like trying to convince me to like like disgusting food. <laughs> Eat it. You like it. No, I actually don't. I, I they, they like people that are aesthetically pleasing. They want people that that, that look, you know, desirable to them. That doesn't need to be a size double zero. That's not healthy either. I don't want to see a girl that that looks deathly ill and no. at a size triple, quadruple, that you know, zero. And I don't want to see the other end of the spectrum either. There is a happy medium. And we're avoiding that happy medium and we're lying to society. And, and worst of all, we're lying to ourselves. Yeah. And, you know, going back to this idea of personal responsibility, it's both, it's really hard to hear as someone whose health has, is, is far gone, but at the same time, it's what they need to hear. It's, it's pretty harsh, but I say this to some of my clients. Your life is your fault. I love that. Your life is your fault. Everything that's happening right now in your life, especially your health, that's your fault. Now, the beautiful thing about that is it's your fault. So at any point, you can turn things around. And, you know, we talk about obesity being the number one killer of Americans. The most amazing thing about obesity is not only is it preventable, it's reversible. It's not like some disease you catch that you can't get rid of. It is 100% reversible. All it takes is personal responsibility, making those hard choices. Because guess what, guys? I'm going to say this to a camera. Being healthy is hard. Being healthy is hard. Working hard is hard. I mean, I'm sure, Candice, you got to the point today. It was hard to get to where you are today. It's not easy to, yeah. to accomplish things. It's not easy to be healthy. It's not easy to carve moments out of your day to take care of your body, drink a lot of water, cook food at home instead of buy fast food or order food. It's not easy. No. And once you accept that it's not easy, it gets easier. Exactly. <laughs> Once you accept that, hey, you accept there's it. no magic, there's no magic pill, no magic wand. I actually am just going to have to work at this every single day. It gets easier. But the radical left wants to convince us that there should not be suffering in the world. Mm -hmm. That it, it it is suffering. I mean, that we're humans, you know, and and we know that God put us on this earth as humans that we're going to suffer, but we can still wake up every single day and know that we have His grace and we have His love. You can renew, and we can renew, and and that's why I think it's it's so sad to see. See us move so far away from religion and from God because I think that's where a big part of the personal responsibility just fades away. Absolutely. You know? Absolutely. And it's it's such it becomes it becomes all for naught. Yeah. There's nothing bigger than me. And and this is how you see this this atheist, this cult is what I see it as, is this the growth of atheism mm -hmm. um, is always parallel to the growth of government and to the growth of narcissism and 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 to the breakaway from the family yeah. and and the things that once matter that were so simple that you talk about when in Georgia, in a small little town. What are they getting right? 
that they that they haven't made they haven't broken away from those values. Yeah. These are people that have deep values, deep, and 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 they are surrounded by a culture and a media that tells them that there's something wrong with them because they believe in their family because they have faith, mm-hmm. um, and they believe in personal responsibility. And, Try it. And the more that we recognize our self worth, and the more that we recognize that our worth does not come from the government. Our worth does not come from entertainment, from social media. The more we recognize that our self-worth comes from a higher power, comes from God, the better choices we can make for ourselves. So there's this really interesting study that was done. So, you know, a lot of people say one of the reasons why black communities and Hispanic communities suffer disproportionately from obesity is because they don't have the same resources and the same options as we do, which in a way is true. But there have been studies done showing that when you provide healthy options and you provide fresh produce, you provide good food to these communities, they still choose the junk food and the fast food. Yeah. They still choose it. And some people will say that's a matter of culture, but there's a part of me that that believes people are making these choices because they don't recognize their own self-worth and they don't recognize the worth of fighting for themselves and fighting for their own health. Right. Because – the government has been giving so many handouts, so they feel like that's where their worth comes from. They feel like there's some external source that gives them worth, right? But if we come back to recognize where our self-worth truly comes from, that is from which the point where you can make healthier choices. And right. that's when you're like, no, it's worth it's worth making this small sacrifice of not eating that birthday cake at the offers. It's worth that, that small sacrifice of not going out and binge drinking with my friends because I know what my self-worth is. Right. And the sense of accomplishment, and that's what I think that they're missing out on, is a sense of accomplishment when you do get it right. Um, and knowing that you've had setbacks, but you get, you get back on the saddle, it, it, there's a sense of accomplishment um, that I cannot speak enough to. And like I said, for me, and this might seem crazy, but I was literally feeling so sad because working out has always just been a part of my life. Mm-hmm. I love working out. Um, I love I love breaking a sweat. There's something about breaking a sweat that just sets your day right. Yep. Um, and I had su- I had started making all these excuses in the back of my head when I stopped working out because I was traveling so much and and yeah I was. I'm always going to be thin, but I it was I was flabby and I wasn't feeling good. Oh, but Candice, you work so much, you travel so much, it's fine. Like this is it's not conducive to your lifestyle anymore, but. Deep down, when you go to sleep at night, you know, you can make changes. You there, can get up an hour earlier. There are always excuses. All, I'm like, all I need are a pair of sneakers. And now yeah. I go running outside, <laughs> outside of my hotels, wherever I am. How great it feels now that I'm back to working out. I, I feel like myself again. I feel yeah. good. I feel happy. Stop, don't, allow, don't allow yourself to manifest the excuses, I think is what I want people to know. When you see these people using the hashtag body positivity and, 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 and they're assigning that to being slobs and, and to showing your cellulite, they're not actually happy. And they're, and they're showing you to miss out on what it feels like when you actually accomplish something despite despite despite, despite. How, how how it seems like it's impossible or it can be an uphill climb when you actually get to the top of that hill you're like wow i did it yeah and there's no better feeling than that i mean i even see i have some clients that i have online and so we do a lot of skype sessions i can see the joy in their eyes just through the computer screen and it's not because they lost weight sure that's that's a great byproduct but it's because they took responsibility they took control of their life again and there's nothing more empowering than that and yet at the same time it's you know it's the fake news and the radical left they want us to give the power away, Mm -hmm. you know? And I mean, it's little things like I posted, I I posted a little story slide. I just said, the simple fact, you are allowed to have an opinion, no matter your skin color, no matter what your experience is, you're allowed to have an opinion. And this white girl responded to me and said, yeah, but I feel like white people should just shut up sometimes. I'm like, why are you trying to silence yourself? Why are you trying to give your power away? It's within the realms of lunacy, you know? And it's like, (laughs) so you're telling yourself to shut up? Why do you hate yourself that much? You know, and it's like taking back the control of our lives and realizing that our life is our fault. There's nothing more liberating than that. It, it means we have a lot of hard work to do, but at the end of the day, it's the most liberating thing there is. I love that. I think that's a perfect place to end by telling everybody that your life is your fault. I actually think that that's a, that's a really good way of looking at it. Your life is your fault. Uh, so we wrap every episode of the Candace Owen Show by giving you the opportunity to look into this camera um, two minutes and you get to leave a voice message for the world, I guess a video message for the world, say anything you want. Want. Wow. Let, it, let it be Gina Florio's call to action. Chris is going to put two minutes on the clock, but don't look at him because we've seen people get very nervous when he does that. Okay. Are you ready? I'm ready. On your mark, get set, world, I give you Gina Florio. 
Without our health, we have absolutely nothing in this world. We're not able to accomplish great things. We're not able to enjoy our family. We're not able to enjoy all the joys of life. Your health is the most important thing that you have in this world. Don't let anyone tell you that the reason you look the way that you are is someone else's fault. Um, and when it comes to fake news and the radical left, do not believe everything that you read. If there's anyone out there, especially on college campuses, young student organizations, who wants me to come in and tell you more about my experience, I would absolutely love to our bodies we only get one in this life and it's a temple and it's a very precious thing so treat your body right and take care of yourself that was great thank you so much for joining the Candace thank Owen you for show having me, Candace. that was awesome thank 39 you. seconds we'll keep we'll keep the minute in 20 seconds <laughs> <laughs> thank you guys for watching the latest episode of the Candace Owen show I hope you guys enjoyed the conversation as much as I did as many of you guys already know PragerU is a 501c3 nonprofit organization which means we need your help to keep all of our content free to the public please consider making a tax-deductible donation today I would really appreciate your support